go back to the beginning of the 959. The 959 was really um, Helmut Bott's way of looking at the future of the 911. That's what it was. And without anything holding him back, he basically developed that car to, to an extremely forward level suspension, all-wheel drive, six-speed, twin-turbo. He did all these things in that car that really was kind of a window into the future of Porsche. And he did it with, it seems like, no restrictions because obviously they lost a lot of money building the car. They didn't build very many. Uh, it wasn't practical where they were building them. They were really being hand-built. So, so it became a collector car out of necessity. It was too expensive otherwise to build it as a production car but it gave us a chance to see what the future of 911 looked like. And, and I said the first time I drove it, I said the car is literally at least 20 years ahead of its time. That's a long story. But, but the bottom line was there was no way to bring him in the U.S. initially. They weren't coming in. Porsche decided not to bring him here. Al Hobart had tried to bring in the 959S's and, uh, and actually called me when they were, got here and then the, then the government said they couldn't be here because they thought that was a way to get some of the cars in as track cars. So basically, I had one here. I did have one here. I brought probably the first one in the country came in and I had possession of it. And I couldn't drive it, but I had it. And we just started trying to figure out how to make it legal. And the, the, the harder we tried to go down the normal regulation paths that were available, like become a manufacturer, do crash testing, do EPA certification, the more we went down that path to try and see if we could make the car legal, which would have seemed doable, we ran into hurdles. We ran into more and more hurdles and basically to a point where um, certain people at the, at, the, at the U.S. government level said, you're not going to get that car certified like other cars, um, given its history. Having said that, I wasn't about to give up. I wasn't about to take that and say, send the cars back. We're not doing that. It was, okay, there must be an alternative plan. And we, st I, I mean, I, one of the things I did was just started calling everybody and asking everybody and raising questions about what if, how, everything else. And uh, that led me to an attorney in Washington, D.C. And I explained the car to him in terms of what it was in the system, that it, it wasn't a certified car for the United States. There wasn't a U.S. equivalent. Um, it was a, a short production window car. You know, it was 300 cars, basically. And it was, it, did he have any ideas on how we might get this some regulations to certify this kind of car. And, um, and that's how we got there. I mean, basically, he went from a legal point of view and, and I provided technical information and he created basically a bill, you know, a regulation that could be part of a bill. And uh, next thing you know, I mean, not next thing, it was 10 years, but 10 years later, it was a bill passed in Congress. And uh, it became known as show and display. And, I don't even remember where that came from, but, but it was a comment made at some point, at, I'm sure at, uh, at DOT level or something, but it allowed you know, this car, based on its significance, to come in the country without doing crash testing. And the requirement was to do emissions testing, to make it emissions legal for the United States, up to the same standard as the year of production. So we felt we could do that, and um, then it was harder harder to do than we thought, but we, we were able to accomplish that, and not only to a federal regulation, but to the California state regulation. And uh, once we got the emissions done on the cars, then we were able to, to license them and people were able to drive them down the road. If you look back at what Helmut Bott's plan was, first of all, that was in an era right then and there when there was a question whether Porsche would ever build a rear engine 911 again because they were building 924s, 944s, 928s. And I 
remember very clearly that there was a lot of conversation at Porsche. There, there was a feeling that, oh, the 911 goes away now. It's gone. That, that Porsche development will be front engine cars and other things, right? And, and this was in the 80s. And, uh, and that always really bothered me because they said Porsche is the 911, period. I mean, it's their DNA. So it was shocking that they would talk about that car going away. Helmut Bott in the 959 really wanted to prove that there was a future for the 911. And by, and by building a car with all the advancements and all the development that he could think of in that car, he could actually test the theory that the 911 would be here 10 years from, from then, 20 years from then, 30 years from then, 40 or 50 years from then. So here we are more than 30 years from that point in time, and the 911 is as good a car as it's ever been. And you can still buy it with a six-speed. So, you know, it's, uh, I think that's important to know that, that that car, that car may have saved the 911 for the future, that one development project, no matter what it cost Porsche at the time.